this is my talk, uh, All Chat Applications, Lesson 2. This bit was uh, removed from the program, but it's quite important. I'm hoping to go a bit further in your sort of standard uh, Elixir tutorial. So for the people who've already arrived, uh, hands up if you've already played with Elixir to some degree. Okay, so it's about 50-50. So uh, this is what we're going to try and cover. We're going to try and cover some topics around Docker, how you configure these services, service discovery, testing, and then what it means to be sort of cloud native in 2017. Uh, spoilers, so we're going to make a chat app. It's a classic Elixir starting point. Um, I've done this before, so if you just like code, if you go to this URL, which is my website, you can see the source code for this app. And there's also a video of me just going through the coding. Uh, in this, we'll talk a lot more about why we've chosen various things. So I'm Peter. Uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, I'm crowd hailers all over the internet. Uh, and I currently work at paywithcurl.com, who let me take a few days off to come out here so to get a shout out. So from the beginning, um, yeah, not this far back. Uh, so this is how we start a new Elixir project. Uh, so for half of you that haven't seen this, this is going to be sort of lesson one. So we're going to quickly go through setting up a new project. So Mix is the build tool for Elixir. Um, we start a new www project, which is going to be the web interface for our application. Um, and we want it to be supervised. So if you were here for talk Francesco just gave, uh, supervision uh, is a pattern for uh, in, a, in Erlang, uh, which is inherited by Elixir. All of the OTP goodness comes through. So, oh, that's better. OK. So this is our first module. This is our chat module. Um, PG2 uh, is a module that comes bundled in with the core Erlang distribution. Uh, anything which comes bundled into the Erlang core is available from Elixir. Um, I apologize for showing you some Elixir code. So soon after, Francesco has just sold you on a load of Erlang code. Um, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll take them as you go through if you want, because uh, I think it's important that, you know, if you don't understand, you can see. So what we have here is we have a simple chat module. Uh, we create a room with a room name. So this is just a process group we're creating. To publish, uh, we find all the members of the room name. And we send a message to every single one of them. And to join a room, you just join the process group. So when you join the process group, uh, anyone who wishes to publish to all the members of the group uh, just has to pull out the list of all the processes, and we can transparently send a message to all of those processes. So this is the, uh, the Elixir equivalent of the send. So we're going to send a message of this format to this process. And here we're using the four comprehensions to loop through all the members, so every client in that room. So PG2, this is just module summary, is part of the Erlang distribution. Their documentation is very unjazzy, but you'll get used to that when you're going through. Um, one thing people ask about Elixir is do you need to learn Erlang? No. But eventually, you'll find it useful to sort of investigate the stuff that's already there. OK, to the web. So uh, here is, um, who's familiar with API Blueprint? Wow, that's deafening silence there. So oh, here's one in the corner. Swagger would be the other one. OK, so I've picked the wrong horse here. This is API Blueprint. Um, what this says is this is a sort of, it's a specification for our, our web application. So we have a home page action, which is got at the index. We have a publisher message, which is a post to the index. And we have a stream of updates, which is get from the update part. And we're going to send down a stream of, stream of messages there. Um, to use this blueprint, we can, uh, so in Elixir, so there's this uh, rack layer we've got. Um, we want a rack server. And we want to use that blueprint to route to that. <coughs> so those of you familiar with uh, Elixir may have come across Plug. Plug is a middleware layer. Uh, it's, fits the role of Rack in Ruby, uh, Ring in Clojure. Um, probably pick your language, they've all got one. Rack is something which is an alternative to Plug. Uh, we had, uh, I've had problems with Plug in a couple of cases, uh, but these were related to some odd edge cases I was doing with streaming up and uh, message signing, because you have uh, one direct access to the socket to be able to read the body twice. Uh, if you're looking to just get started, I would say go with Plug. It's you know, widely adopted, it's, it's much more used. Uh, for this talk, it's not going to be important. It's just going to be a, an Elixir application we're going to deploy, and we're going to look at Docker, so we can move on. Uh, Ace is a server you'll need to run Rax applications, and that fills up our ecosystem here. Uh, the one nice thing about Ace is it was built with HTTP2 in mind first, so if that's something you're interested in, the Ace server is a good one to look at. Okay. Here's our, here's our application thing. So we go back to this one. So this says it's a Rax application. We're going to start it with the Ace server. 
Start link is a pattern that comes up a lot in Elixir and Erlang modules. You call this to create a process that's gonna run your code connected to the original calling process. This is also how you build up supervision trees. Okay. So in racks, this is what a, a controller looks like. So we say again, it's a server. We have a single handle request function. Uh, this is something, again, pattern from the rack framework. Um, you get a request, you get an original state, you create a response. Uh, this is an, these are pipe arrows. Uh, I think they were taken from F sharp, possibly. Um, they are something on top of Erlang, one of the niceties that Elixir gives you. And it takes um, the result of the uh, part before it and feeds it as the first argument. So here we have a function which will set the header on a response. Uh, so here we're gonna add the content type header to a response. This function has a first argument, which is the original response. And then we set the body. This would also would take response as a first argument, so we pipe it through. So it's a really nice way to sort of compose uh, parts of your application. Here's just another example of the controller. So here's how we publish a message. So these requests that were given, uh, we have a bit more information. So the request has a body, which we can just pattern match on to extract. We don't need to like fetch it in any way. Um, and then a configuration, so we have a room name, which we can then pass to our publish message. And again, we're using this piping uh, pattern to go through an issue of steps and setting our response. Uh, final one, so I might skip over, well, we can go through this, but um, this is sort of things, check the documentation. <coughs> this is how we do a streaming response. So we set up a response for our original handle request. So we get a message at this point, and we say a response. At this point, we just send the response that we have, and we've set a new state for our process. So here we've set the body to true, which says there will be a body in this response, but we don't yet know what it is. We then have a handle info callback, which is whenever this uh, long running process gets a message from another part of the system. Here we pattern match on the type of that message, so the first argument is message. So here we can see it's come from our chat module, and it has a certain message. And we, uh, we build it into an event, so service and event. And we then say we wanna send this part of the message, so we add it to the body of our response, we keep streaming, and we set up the new state. So that's our, that's our full chat application. This is the final sort of part of the puzzle. This is an application module. This is where we declare that supervision tree, which gives us the yeah, sort of the fault tolerance and a lot of the reliability that Elixir gives us. So we have a list of children we want to supervise. Here we say that that children is also a supervisor. This is a slightly cumbersome API, but in the latest version of Elixir, it's being reduced, so it's uh, more succinct. And we say we want to start our www module with uh, some configuration and some options. Those options are just the port and to say clear text. Um, one caveat, if you use clear text, you will not get HTTP2 support. Uh, by default, um, most browsers will only use HTTP2 over HTTPS. Um, so we started that server, and then we say here, so we have this strategy, so these are a few of the declarative things. So one for one says if this process dies for any unknown reason, I mean it really doesn't matter, like anything could happen, we're just gonna restart a new one. So all existing connections will be lost, which is, which is a shame, but itself that shouldn't happen very often. It's a sort of worst case catch-all. But if that were to happen uh, due to like machine failures or anything, we're just gonna start a new one and go back to where we were. So the service is still up after a temporary break. And there we go. That would be essentially lesson one to building a chat application. So this will run, this will take many concurrent connections and will stream all between them. The reason I call this lesson one is because this is on one node. So when you start this locally, you get one node. That's not really what Francesco was promising us, but this is what a lot of your introductory blog articles will, will give you. So we move on to lesson two. So in my sort of abstract of this talk, I was gonna say, is Docker even useful? You know, maybe we should use it, maybe we shouldn't. We're gonna jump in and we're gonna use it. We're gonna sort of um, validate it later. We're gonna discuss a bit more, but for now, Docker, we're going with Docker. So who's got Docker installed on their machine? Hands up. Excellent. Who has Docker uh, in production? Who uses Docker in production? Okay, so a smaller number, about a third, maybe two thirds have it on their machine. You're exactly the audience I want to be talking to. This is good. Uh, Docker Compose, so if you're familiar with Docker, Docker Compose is just a way of running multiple Docker machines at the same time. So here's a simple Docker file. Uh, this bit you apparently all know, but we'll go through it. We start from an Elixir base image. It has Elixir installed. We copy our, uh, we, we, these are essentially they're part of the build tool ecosystem. They're worth putting this line in. 
We then copy our code in and we run this start script. And our start script is just to run Elixir with a certain node name and a certain secret cookie. And we run the mixed task. Um, we'll go through in detail sort of what the node name and the cookie give us, but this is a good starting point. This is the Docker Compose file, which will allow us to do that. So here we're going to run um, one WW service. It's going to be in the WW file. Uh, we use its Docker file, and we set an Erlang cookie to a better secret than that. And we want to expose our 8080 port. Okay, so in development, now we have Docker. This is how we start all the services. So Docker Compose will just start every service in that file. Docker Compose down will stop every service in that file. And this is how you run, essentially, in uh, the Docker Compose environment. So Mix is the uh, build tool for Elixir. And once you get used to this, you essentially run everything inside some Docker Compose process or another. Well, maybe not process container. It's probably a better way of saying that. To build with Docker, uh, we tag an image. So every time you run Docker Compose up, you'll get an image, which is made from the most recent version of your code. Uh, so I'm Crowdhaler all over the internet, including on Docker Hub. So this says I'm going to tag an image with my name, like in my repository. I'm going to call it www. We then push it up, and so it's now available to use. And we can deploy it. So this is where the options start getting a bit bigger. There's quite a lot of uh, deployment solutions for Docker. Um, I'm going to use Docker Cloud, not because it's the best, but because it's the simplest with sort of the nat native ecosystem in Docker. Um, and I don't want to sort of overload you with things to, to look into. You can have a, a great afternoon reading Rancher versus Kubernetes versus et cetera uh, later on if you want. Okay. So this is our startup wizard to run our, our application. We obviously need some machines. So here we're starting a node cluster. We're going to call it chat. Uh, we're going to have them in Bangalore. I connected to DigitalOcean. Uh, we want, and we want three of them. So three is a good, good number to get started. This is uh, the configuration for our service. Uh, I'm saying that I want to use the latest version of that image. I'm going to give it a service name, which is www, and I'm going to add it to the stack chat. Uh, these are concepts within, so there's concepts that are migrating to Docker, uh, but exist only in Docker Swarm and Docker Cloud. The Docker ecosystem, some bits of it are much more stable than other parts, so the creation of images, tagging of images in the repositories, I would say, most of the stuff I'm telling you here is likely to be true next year. Uh, this is far more in flux. I'm very hopeful that it'll settle down. Um, sort of, again, it's the discussion between Kubernetes, Rancher, and so on and so forth. So here, a stack is a collection of services running together. So they would be your whole application. Um, and then a service is uh, a set of containers all running the same image. So they're essentially just replications of a given container. And that's, again, for scalability, uh, resilience, et cetera, that you'd run multiple instances. Uh, we're going to deploy here. So this is an unusual deployment strategy. We're just going to have one um, container running this image on every single node. Um, that's because we don't have anything else at the moment. So there's no point having uh, less containers than nodes, because then we'll just have unused nodes. And because we're going to cluster them all together, and um, Erlang gives us that transparent message passing, uh, there's really no point having more than one container per node. It doesn't give you anything. It's just an unnecessary division uh, in your setup. Uh, we're going to say auto-redeploy. So if I push a new version of my image here, it's just going to roll it out. Uh, we then need to expose the port. So 8080 was the one which I've set internally to run. Uh, 8443 does a secure service. And then this 4001 is some monitoring tools, which we'll show later. And then here's our secret cookie, which is set. Uh, this is what it looks like on Docker Cloud once it's running. Uh, and then there's this stack file thing, which is, again, part of this sort of menagerie of terms which exist. This stack file looks like a compose file. Um, you can run a compose file as a stack file, but you can't run a stack file as a compose file. I really hope that if you've not looked at this already, and if you, in, like, in not long, this difference will go away. Um, one of the main differences is we're here, we're not running, uh, where is it? So yeah, so we've set a particular image. We've not set a build path. So this will use the image that we create in a separate step whereas Docker Compose allows us to use source code and just run, uh, which is much quicker, obviously, for local development, so you change the source code and then rerun. Okay, uh, this is to remind me to be calm and slow down. I have no idea how far through we are. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, keep them for the end. Because. So why, why Docker? Um, 
It's a good question. I asked it, so you know I'll probably answer it now. Uh, well, it's hot right now. Uh, Docker is Docker is a trend. We should all jump on that. Um, this is the uh, the Google Trends. So this red line is Docker, and this uh, this blue one was virtualization because that was what we did before Docker. Uh, last year, this graph looked interesting because you could see virtualization going down. Um, this year, Docker's so far ahead that you can barely even notice the lump that was virtualization in the past. Uh, all joking aside, it is good to fit in. Um, Docker is meant to give us a sort of a reusable base to work from. And that mere aim in itself is a good reason to use it. Um, it allows you to experiment with Elixir without introducing, like changing the existing build process, uh, which is why I say that you're, you know, an audience to talk to. Uh, because at the end, I will show you uh, some setup where you can get started using Elixir without even having to bother installing Elixir on your machine. You just use a Docker file. If you've got Docker, Docker Compose, there is no other setup needed. Again, you get, get to do quick experimentation. So if you have an Elixir project running, uh, for me to go, maybe I should use a Neo4j data store or anything. Like the whole thing is just this nice, this nice way to package things in. Uh, and you know, if you want to go that way, the microservices future where we all run hundreds of different of languages to keep your developers happy, uh, you can do that. Uh, so this is just more good Docker goodness. Um, you get to you know, reproduce development, uh, reproduce environments locally, so you can start a fleet of containers. So this is what Docker Compose is really good for. That you can have multiple things going at the same time. Before, if you wanted to test uh, a multi-service sort of setup, that was quite a challenge. Um, and this one, I think, is quite an interesting step. You can model Docker-free production environments. So even if you're not sold on Docker, you can use Docker, just use a basic, say, Ubuntu image from Docker. Use it locally, so you can start up three Docker containers. You can deploy apps to them. There's nothing stopping you then deploying those apps bare metal or, well, not bare metal, just straight to your Ubuntu VMs in the cloud. Um, so I had a Docker setup, which was modeling a Heroku setup for a while. It was just a nice way to bring in a database. And I had a Docker setup where I was experimenting with clusters um, because that's a challenge in sort of the Erlang ecosystem. You want to run with clusters, but they're hard to do. So I span up four or five Docker containers and was able to just play around as if it was real clustering. Uh, in both cases, I then just pushed to DigitalOcean image machines or Heroku. And again, this diverse selection of pre-built containers. So adding a database is find a database image, set some values, go, and you're done. No version managers. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is a point I really like. So there's no sort of managing, oh, I've got Elixir 1.2 or Elixir uh, 6 because um, and that's managed in Docker. Again, it's just a different image. So it's just part of a sort of configuration layer you've already got. Um, I've taken this so far. I don't actually have Elixir installed on my machine. I only use it within containers. Um, that's not actually entirely true. I've actually got the master version of Elixir installed on my machine. So I can use this new formatter tool, but I can use it on old Elixir code bases. So that's a very nice sort of freedom as well. Downsides. Obviously, there are some downsides with Docker. <coughs> uh, one of the main downsides is it's just another technology. Um, and if you don't know it already, there's time taken to get to know it. Uh, the best way to mitigate this problem is to not get carried away. Just keep it simple. The Docker file I showed you, um, anyone who knows Docker could probably point to several inefficiencies in it. That's fine. It got me started. If I need that efficiency later, I can add it after you know I've proven the system. Uh, don't, one of the key things to this is don't use stripped down operating systems. So there's um, Alpine, and there are pre-built Alpine Elixir images. And one day I thought, oh, I would love to save those few kilobytes. I'll use Alpine Elixir. And everything was going well until I wanted to debug. So I shelled in. Nothing that I knew was there on the machine. So you had to look up all of the um, Alpine documentation. Nothing in my life was made better by saving those kilobytes. So again, once it goes to production, once you've got some proof, once you've got some people who know what they're doing, you can bring Alpine into the mix. Uh, and the final one on that is use the official Elixir image. Um, it's built on a, um, well, it's not built on Alpine, the official one. Just don't get yourself lost in the Docker maze. It's really easy. There's a lot of people talking about it. Um, just keep it simple. 
Secondly, uh, don't get carried away by microservices. If you can't build a monolith, what makes you think microservices is the answer? There's, a, there's a, an article about sort of the microservice ball of mud. If you can't design a good system with modules for separation, you're not really going to improve your situation with microservices. Microservices might be your answer, but microservices doesn't mean Docker, and Docker doesn't mean microservices. So those are two completely separate things. Um, and you should remember that. You should keep your freedom and just not, again, don't drink all the Kool-Aid in one go. A Docker file with a single image running on a single machine is still getting you started with Docker. Cool. So this final one uh, about Docker, I think it's the final one. Uh, it's neither a plus or a negative. Um, immutable infrastructure is another sort of trend uh, in 2017, which is make in encode all of your steps to set up your infrastructure, like encode, so this is the Docker Compose file. So when you run Docker Compose up, um, it sets your system as near production as possible. The reason to do this is if you have a problem or someone else needs to start your work, you give them the Docker Compose file, they run Docker Compose up, they're back to where you were. This means no relups. So, so relups is a short for the updates that Francesco introduced in the talk before, where you can live install uh, new code and then switch through the processes. Uh, he alluded to the fact that it's not easy. In fact, I'd go so hard to say, far as to say it's really hard. Um, don't do it is a solution. That, that works. Um, with Docker, you can have blue-green deploys. You can have two versions running at the same time. There are other solutions. Um, again, if you want to have the time to look into it, and you're more than welcome to, um, Docker would be a great place to practice, but you would mess up a lot of the advantages you get with immutable infrastructure. And I think that should be considered as quite a big negative, actually. So that was Docker. Do I need it? No. Could be useful. Keep it simple. Um, I'll keep saying this because I've seen some mess with Docker. Just get it working, move on. Uh, and it will change a lot about how you work, mostly in a good way, but it does change quite a lot of things. So, service discovery. Yeah, any questions so far? I will keep up. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, how do you do TDD? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's nothing about how it's done which changes. Instead of running mixed test, you run Docker Compose run WW mixed test. Uh, so uh, one of the things you can do with Docker is you can mount local volumes in. Uh, so when you mount your local volume into a container, you can um, make a code change and run a single command. That command is quite long, <coughs> so I would alias that to my local machine, but that's, you know, that's an issue you can solve. But again, yeah, if you make a code change and you've mounted that volume and you run Docker Compose mix test, you'll get the t answer immediately. Um, and Docker run, uh, it shows you the output of the shell. So you'll see your test results, you'll see any debug information. It's exactly the same as running locally, really. Um, there's no reason for your process to change. Anything else? Okay. So service discovery. Here we go. So one machine cannot have fault tolerance. Uh, this is one of the things the development of Erlang got to quite quickly, uh, was if you need a fault tolerant system, you need two machines. If you have two machines, it must be concurrent. Those are not negotiable pieces of information. A lot of that leads to sort of the architecture of Erlang, just that fact alone. If you have more than one machine, you need to know how to find it. You need to know where it is on the network. Uh, Erlang comes with this... Uh, I don't know if it's a module. It comes with a um, distributed Erlang, but this is built in. Um, and of course, it's therefore also built into Elixir. <coughs> Whenever I talk about Erlang, it's really just sort of uh, pickiness. Um, you can just translate Erlang to Elixir and you're, and you're fine. Uh, so here we, to do distributed Erlang, uh, here we have this command again. So we start um, our mix project with a, a name and a cookie. Uh, within that shell, you can connect to another known node. So here we have, so if, if our host name was something else uh, and there was a machine which was at WW1 DNS and it had an um, Nerlang VM running which was called app, you would connect just like this. Um, I've not solved the problem I was going to talk about because how do you know what that is? That's the question. Um, and then once you've connected, you can find a list of all the processes, all the machines, 
or nodes you're connected to. The nice thing about distributed Erlang is if A connects to B and C connects to B, A and C are automatically connected. It's a fully meshed network. So you don't have to find every node in the system, you just have to find one. Um, that, that allows you to simplify a lot of the sort of search process. Uh, this is the standard way to uh, configure that list of nodes you're going to look for with Erlang. So you set a list of, um, I just copied this straight from the documentation. I don't know why their project's called CAVE. I could not find the answer to that. Um, so yeah, so CP, CP2, CP3 at CAVE. We're going to try and connect to all of them. And um, we say we're going to sync nodes mandatory. So we're not going to let the system start until it's found CP2 and CP3 at CAVE. Picture of a cloud because we're in a cloud environment, things change much quicker. So distributed Erlang is really good. It gives you the transparent message passing. Uh, they were way ahead of their time with distributed systems. Probably the area you'll notice the sort of friction the most is uh, the environments they were working with were not the cloud environment we have now. So the things they were working with were not as transient as we have now. Uh, so this is the biggest thing which needs, which needs smoothing out. And there's work on it, so every, like every month it's getting better, but it's one thing to be aware of. So service discovery. In the cloud, things are always changing. You don't know the service locations ahead of time, so you can't just provide a list up front. And even if you can provide a list up front, you don't know the order they're going to start in. You don't know how long they're going to be there. Uh, the whole point is you can lose one machine without taking down the system, but that list of required nodes is kind of exactly the opposite. It requires all of them to be there. This is true with or without Docker. So if you decide to start a whole bunch of virtual machines and put your uh, Elixir project on them, you would still need to find the other nodes. Um, there's also a slight distinction between node discovery and service discovery. Uh, node discovery, so on the Docker Compose, well, on the Docker Cloud, we had the concept of a service, and a service was uh, several containers all running the same code. If you want to cluster those together, I would call that node discovery. It's about finding all of the machines running the same code as you and forming a cluster. Uh, a, a service discovery is finding some other service that you want to call out to. And you wouldn't necessarily obviously want to find all the nodes. Just any one that can deliver that service to you is good enough. So node discovery is what we're trying to solve here. Docker Cloud. So Docker Cloud gives you a whole load of nice conventions. Our service was called www. In the network that Docker Cloud gives us, uh, if we call that uh, URL, it is a URL, it's quite short there, um, we will find one of those machines, we'll be routed to one of those machines. And it also actually keeps a DNS entry for every single uh, machine, every single container running. Uh, so we can actually, in, in this case, we can just keep trying to connect to WW1 and WW2, and that'll keep our node cluster live. So we're not gonna do anything if they go down. That's sort of one of the things with the cloud environment. We're not gonna try and rescue if one of them goes away. We're just gonna trust that when they come up, new machines are gonna connect to one of the first two. And if we have uh, 15 machines come up, if they all connect to the first one, then they're in a fully connected cluster. So Docker Cloud gives you these discoverable host names within a container. Docker Compose does not. <coughs> so uh, this is a very environment sort of specific problem. Uh, so Google Container Engine, uh, that's Kubernetes underneath. And then there's uh, EC2 or ECS, which is the uh, AWS container service. They're all different environments and they all have different solutions at the moment. Uh, so I would point you to this library, libcluster. Again, this is one of those sort of brilliant tools. This is not uh, part of the standard distribution. You will have to include it. Um, but it has, this is just copied verbatim from its readme, uh, standard distributed Erlang facilities, uh, UDP gossip, uh, which works in Docker Compose if you set it up the right way. Then there's Kubernetes and there's also Rancher, which is yet another orchestration solution. So you can form a cluster on any one of those. Configuration, rules of configuration. Uh, there is only one environment that matters, production. So don't configure as much as possible. Um, in the code I showed you, we listened on port 8080. It's very easy for you to write code, so it comes naturally, read from an environment variable what this port is, choose the port, start on that port. We control the complete container. We can say that this container will always listen on 8080. We can hard code that in. We don't need to configure that. It's then just a problem for the compose file, how we stick them together. You can route to a specific port. Um, it's amazing how far you can get without configuration. 
Uh, so much so that when I gave, did the walkthrough uh, of this application, uh, I was worried I'd manage to get rid of all of the configuration and wouldn't show, wasn't able to show how to set up the configuration. Uh, the next thing on that is always follow production. So if on production you're reading from an environment variable, set up the environment variable in your Docker Compose environment. Uh, really try to minimize the difference between them. Uh, with Docker Compose, you get so far with this, you have a, a database and a URL you can choose. You can then set up all of those things. And uh, this is my own personal advice. Avoid relying on named environments because there's gonna be more of them. Um, dev, prod, test, but then you're like, well, the staging, that should be prod, but obviously we don't want it to move real money, so it's gonna have, it's gonna pay up, say we have a different Stripe uh, endpoint. Well, CI, well, that should be test, but we don't wanna run the slow test, or we do wanna run the slow test. So they, they look like each other, but they'll always end up being some difference. So just have a list of environment variables, set them for each environment, and don't bother trying to name what environment is. Surface testing. This is a term, uh, basically this is integration testing. Uh, I call it surface testing because it really um, emphasizes you should test an interface that someone cares about. Uh, so I think I reordered these slides. So surface testing, we'll go to the code base here. So in this test suite, I'm using HTTP Poison, so that's a client library, to call my WW service and test that it does what it should do. I run this in a separate, um, in a separate mix project, so it's a completely separate Elixir application. And what it means is I can actually replace my Elixir application with, say, a Go application and not change the test suite. These tests are not that much slower. You can do things massively in parallel. The system optimizes, I like loop back interface. Uh, but there's no abstractions at this level. People, if you're writing an API, the people who are using it care about what it does when you make certain requests. So if you make that request, you can check that response. This approach does become a bit gnarly, obviously if you have huge amounts of HTML coming back. And it's not a replacement for unit tests. Like if you want a TDD and the unit tests are helpful, then they're still helpful to do. The nice thing about this is if you go through more advanced build steps, uh, so Erlang, you have the ability to make reduced releases. They won't have the test code on. <coughs> Pardon me. And so you can't run the test against that release to check if it's worked properly. <coughs> so after the appropriate amount of deliberate pause, you can run, of course, a surface test against that release. Um, <coughs> and you can actually run your surface test or these integration tests against your running system. So we have a cron job at work where we run this test suite against our staging environment every 15 minutes. It does this like rudimentary sort of pressure testing. It also allows us to check all of our metric information so we can see that you know traffic. It's a very odd traffic pattern. You get a 15 minute spike um, completely regularly. But we can check that tracing's working. We can just check a variety of interesting things because we've got a system always running. <coughs> so cloud native. Cloud native is a term I like distinctly because it's not microservice. Um, it's quite likely that you'll be developing in the cloud in this day and age. Um, it's also quite likely that you don't need to have 100 microservices. Cloud Native just makes a few changes. The first one being that web is really the only interface that matters. Um, true, you can shell in to your running containers. But the more you have, the harder it will be to find the one you need. So if a service is messing up, there could be five instances of that service running, and you'd have to shell into every single one to check or debug. Like you might just be debugging the wrong instance. So getting as much information out so you can aggregate it is really helpful, and that is going to be, I mean, perhaps you should say an internet interface. It doesn't have to obviously be a web one, but it will be over TCP, over the network that's set up in the Docker environment. And documentation is crucial. Documentation was always crucial. That was never, it's not a surprise. Uh, but once you have more than one service, uh, the contracts between them are the hardest thing to test, like testing one service is a lot easier. So that should be very quick to go to. And that was the reason behind um, the blueprint generator I showed earlier. So that uh, Racks blueprint project will take a documentation file, it will actually pass that documentation file and look for the appropriate controllers, rather than the other way around where you annotate your controllers after the fact with documentation. 
uh, and it works quite well, and it just, it, it just keep pushing it forward. So it's one of the things that the Elixir community is very keen on. They have module docs inside the code, so you can document your code, um, and just keep, keep pushing that forward, because eventually um, you'll have 15 services, and one of them will have been made by one person who's left, and you just know nothing, and you'll just have to rebuild it. Uh, this is Wob Server. So um, one of the nice things about uh, the Erlang, well, Beam, is you have an awful, awful lot of introspection tools at your disposal. This is just um, that set of interfaces exposed over a web API. So we can see, we can look at load charts. Um, we can see all the running applications. So that was our supervision tree. So you can see all the, uh, all the processes under a certain tree. And this will just work. So that was why we put the 4001 port out. Again, you can, can configure it. I didn't. 4001 is a perfectly acceptable default. Um, and it gives you a lot of information from day one. Okay, so I've said this a few times. It's a bit of a bugbear. Don't need to do microservices. Docker's very useful. Thanks. So this is me uh, on the internet. Um, Crowdhailer at Twitter. Crowdhailer at uh, GitHub. <coughs> One final thing I wanted to leave up here is this project uh, called Elixir on Docker. Uh, it's a template, so you just clone it to use it. You have the Docker Compose file locally. Um, it is a Rax application. I do use that at work. It's not, it's not a toy project. We are using it in production, but it, be aware that you will be slightly outside the main Elixir, Elixir mainstream. But if you don't have Elixir installed or Erlang installed, but you do have Docker installed, you can start with this straight away. You can clone it, you can run it, you can get, get experimenting. Uh, it has Wob server set up, so if you go to the right port, 4001, you'll see that. It has a surface testing suite set up, so you can run that. It has instructions on how to run it, so there's an example of setting one up. Uh, and it has uh, a few more niceties. So the Docker files are slightly longer than the ones I showed you. Uh, they have the volume mounting, and they have live code reloading. So if you make a change, you can just refresh the page, and it just keeps going through. So that's a few niceties. Um, the main reason for this project is um, deployment is still an open question, uh, particularly in the Elixir environment. Um, and really, it's, it's a sort of focus for my discussions on how we're going to keep going forward of making it better and better. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in finding me, talk to me after this. But if you want to find me later on, just put something on this one. This is a great place to, to go for it. Uh, thanks. So yeah, any questions now we've, yeah. Uh, so the, um, yeah, I'll try and, so your question was, I think, so with the surface testing, uh, how does that integrate when you have multiple things running? Um, so our service tests, they just talk to the service URL, so they're pointed to any of the uh, running containers. So to see everything that happens, you need to obviously aggregate the logs from all of those services. Um, locally, when you run Docker Compose, you can, so I didn't go through everything on Docker and Docker Compose, but if you do Docker Compose logs and a service name, it will show you just the aggregated logs from all of the instances of that service. And that's a pattern you'll use in production as well. So when we run our tests against our staging environment, um, if they go wrong, to debug why they've gone wrong, we log into essentially a copy of our production logging setup. Um, we use Kibana and we use, uh, so we don't use Docker Cloud. Uh, this is good for examples. We use ECS um, and that has a log aggregation mechanism. And so the log aggregation is another topic. Uh, but the nice thing about the integration test is that you can check that you've got a sensible setup. So in many ways, I've not answered your question. It's an open question how you put them together. Um, it's not an elixir question. That's an important thing. So if you've solved it for anything else, it's the same. Um, but yeah, so um, Docker provides facilities to write logs to the disk of the machine. And then AWS, we just have their standard log aggregation, which we use to Kibana to look through. So we can, if our tests start failing, uh, it becomes a real debug exercise because if our tests start failing, we know that would be a customer getting something they didn't want. So we then go through our logs and start trying to debug from our logs. Um, and it, it's really good for finding if sort of third party services are down and stuff like that. But sometimes it is quite, um, quite tricky to go through all the logs. Uh, this is why I would say you really don't want to have 15 services to check if you can get away with it. Um, like we do these things for scalability and fault tolerance. Um, it is harder the more services you have running. Um, 
and there's not really any getting around that. It's just about testing your setup. Answer this? Cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so I don't have all of these things uh, set up. We currently, um, we have to manually run the build again before we deploy it. So the code reloading mechanism doesn't recreate the image. That would take longer. <coughs> it is something I slip up on occasionally. I, I make a load of changes and if I rebuild, fortunately it goes, nothing's changed. Um, so you do then have to run the build as a separate step. And also, I showed you pushing manually to a, to a hub. Uh, yeah, but there's, there are CI solutions, so you can have Travis run your tests, build an image, push it to Hub, Docker Cloud will redeploy based on that new image. Like all of these steps exist. Um, again, it depends on how far you want to go. Um, uh, do you have a Docker setup? Yeah. Okay, so my, um, my answer to you would be, again, don't on day one. Uh, push and so on. Uh, yeah, they exist, and if you want to, we can talk about like CI solutions that exist. Um, but yeah, again, just keep it simple, keep it streamlined to get started. Okay, anyone else? Any more questions? No, yeah? Yeah, uh, on the line of Docker, then you said that uh, Docker makes things easier to update app and redeploy. What is the Elixir uh, version change? The base image change, how do you handle that change? Uh, if the base image changes, um, Essentially, you have to create new versions of all the images on top of that. That is, so Docker's built on these concept of layers, um, and your, uh, the first line of our Docker Compose file was, um, I can't even remember what it starts it with. How far back have we got to go? Da -da -da -da. It is this one. So there's this from line. Um, so each, each line adds a new layer onto your image. So if my code changes, I need to rebuild from this point. Um, that's the main reason you do this first, is because this very rarely changes. So you can run it once, and whenever the code changes, you don't need to redo that step. If your base image changes, you are, if you care about the changes, like it's a security update to your base image, rebuild the whole thing. Um, yeah. Anyone else? I've also, no idea, well, let's check the time. So yeah, any more questions? No, well, thanks for having me and talk to us.